This conference will now be recorded. Hello everyone. We're gonna wait a few seconds before um, everyone joins and then we'll, we'll start the webinar. Hello everyone, so I hope you can hear me well. Um, please tell me in the chat if um, my micro microphone is working well. Um, I am really happy to host this webinar on behalf of SGAC. Um, so welcome to this third edition of the Space Generation Advisory Council's webinar series on space and cybersecurity. Um, HGAC is a global non-governmental nonprofit organization and network which aims to represent university students and young space professionals to the United Nations, space agencies, industries, and academia. Our project group is focusing on space-related cybersecurity issues. And if you would like to join the project group as a member or as an advisor, you can contact the project leaders, Antonia Russo and TF Lem. I'm Clémence Poirier. I'm a research intern at the European Space Policy Institute, and I will be the moderator today. So after a first webinar on cybersecurity and space law, and a second one on the cybersecurity of space-based weapon systems and the protection of space missions from cyber threat, this webinar will focus on space for the Internet of Things. Today, we have the privilege to welcome two great speakers. Uh, Rémi Ferrier, who is Chief Product Officer at Kineis, former engineer at CLS Group and former technical engineer at Thales Alenia Space. He also worked in the public sector for the region Midi-Pyrénées in the south of France. And Rémi uh, graduated from École Polytechnique and Institut des Mines Télécom. Our second guest speaker is James Pavure, a doctoral researcher in cybersecurity at the University of Oxford James graduated from Georgetown University, where he majored in science, technology, and international affairs. His research focuses on satellite system security with a particular interest in satellite broadband communication, space situational awareness data, and satellite hardware security. He recently presented his research at the Black Hat Conference, where he shared a number of his discoveries on the vulnerability of satellite communications. As we have seen in previous webinars, satellite communications are providing broadband that will connect the devices in the Internet of Things, and PNT services are synchronizing all these systems. But satellites are also becoming connected devices in the IoT, as they are increasingly connected with software-defined radios and IP protocols. For these reasons, there is an interest in studying the links between space and the IoT, I, as well as the associated cybersecurity challenges. Now, before I give the floor to Rémi Ferrier, I will remind you to keep your microphones muted and your camera off. You have the opportunity to ask questions through the Q&A button at the top right corner of your screen, and our guest speaker will answer them during the Q&A session at the end of their presentations. You can also follow the discussion on Twitter at Space and Cyber. <laughs> 
So, Remy, you have the floor. You can share your screen now. Hello, everyone. Let me load my presentation. I hope you can see my screen. Yes. Let's do it. Full screen. Okay. So I'm Remy Ferry. I'm a Kinase uh, Chief Product Officer. Very pleased to be here. Thank you for the SGIC for inviting me. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, space IoT, um, and uh, I'll be presenting it from a, a Kinase perspective. We're a satellite operator and a connectivity provider. Uh, for all kinds of uh, IoT devices. Uh, my presentation will be divided in three parts. Uh, I'll start with uh, what is exactly space IoT, how do we do it, and uh, I'll, I'll um, make a link with the, the cybersecurity team and uh, what are the threats that we are facing. So obviously there's a lot of uh, actuality about uh, uh, IoT. What are we dealing with exactly when we talk about the Internet of Things? Uh, nowadays, everything is connected, uh, your device, your mobile, your watch, uh, your uh, sense, temperature sensor in your backyard. Uh, so we're connecting more and more devices. Uh, no one agrees on the number of devices, but everyone agrees on uh, the fact that there's, there are billions of devices already connected today and the trend is only increasing in, in the coming years. So uh, I chose three maps of um, uh, low data rate uh, uh, terrestrial IoT networks, uh, LoRa, Sigfox, and then BIoT, LTEM. Uh, just to illustrate the fact that um, there are various um, solutions to provide co connectivity to um, IoT devices on, on Earth, uh, but obviously none of this network will uh, cover all ground and all sea uh, at any point. And even if countries that are supposed to be covered by a specific network, then uh, there always remains uh, um, white uh, white areas where you cannot uh, have connectivity. So all of this um, makes uh, a reason for um, satellite IoT to exist, and it's been here for for quite a long time now. And uh, we can hope it will only increase in the coming year with this boom of IoT. Um, so this is what we're doing at Kinase. We're trying to offer a global coverage for all IoT devices. Um, as I said, uh, satellite IoT compared to terrestrial IoT um, has its advantage, uh, global coverage. Uh, you obviously don't have to deal with roaming uh, between countries, between frequencies sometimes. Uh, you don't have wide zones as, as long as you can see the, the sky at least. Uh, terrestrial uh, connectivity is, is very useful in other situations where you have very dense areas, where you want to have very low power device. Uh, and you, you want to have a, a lot of data or you want to use indoor applications. But some of those um, items are also addressed by uh, new improvements in the satellite uh, connectivity. Um, there's always uh, technical um, improvements and new modulations uh, trying to, to bring the, the power down. Um, obviously, there's been a lot of development in electronics, so the devices are always uh, smaller and smaller. Um, we can see the trend of a new uh, large constellation uh, that um, will offer uh, near real-time um, revisit. Uh, the more satellite, the, the, the less you have to wait until you can see another one. And obviously, um, the new space business uh, is proposing a new, new business model and lowering the cost. So all of these make it um, more and more interesting for, for satellites to develop uh, IoT connectivity. Today, who is, uh, who is doing uh, space IoT? Uh, I'd say we can divide it in um, um, many three families. Um, you have established players uh, in the middle, uh, Iridium, Opcom, Global Star, just to name a few. Um, those guys have been doing um, uh, IoT broadband, mainly voice, uh, uh, for a long time now. They're trying to diversify and uh, also reach the, the IoT market. Um, Argos, uh, which was the is the origin of Kinase, has also been doing um, uh, IoT for 30 years, uh, trying to uh, connect uh, animals and uh, uh, oceanographic uh, equipments. Um, now we have uh, new space uh, companies. Um, the large one that everyone knows, obviously, 
uh, with SpaceX and Star Starlink, OneWeb, uh, doing uh, internet broadband, but then also uh, a large number of uh, new companies trying to do uh, lower lower red data rate uh, IoT constellations. And um, I had a third um, window uh, for uh, operators trying to uh, uh, expand the terrestrial IoT connectivity through space, uh, trying to receive existing uh, protocols, LoRa, Sigfox, or trying to integrate uh, uh, the satellite component uh, as part of the, the standard for 5G, for example. So there's a lot of, uh, of interest in, uh, in satellite IoT, obviously. Why now? We can wonder. Uh, obviously, it all comes from uh, the new spaces, the new space technology. Um, as an example, uh, 10, 20 years ago, uh, the payload used to uh, communicate with uh, Argos devices uh, weighed uh, tens of kilos. It was uh, on board a uh, very large uh, satellite. Uh, the launch was only for this uh, specific satellite, and it was a uh, um, tens and tens of millions of dollars uh, um, programs. Uh, so obviously, there were, was quite difficult to have a large constellation. And um, if you don't have a large constellation in low Earth orbit, then you, you, ha you can have uh, an increased latency uh, between two satellite paths. So new space is really making a, a big difference in, in this uh, topic because uh, then you can have um, a much smaller payload on board satellite. Um, we've, uh, we, we've managed to uh, miniaturize a lot of the equipment. Um, now it all fits in a, in a shoebox, obviously. Uh, we launched uh, uh, last year uh, 16, uh, the 12U, 12U containing an SDR. So everyone, everything that uh, was uh, in the past uh, very, very heavy and very expensive, uh, we managed to reach the uh, same performances with a, a much smaller equipment today. Uh, the second big difference is obviously you can you can now have uh, uh, new launchers uh, uh, for very reduced amount of what it cost in the past uh, to launch a satellite. So you can uh, increase the number of satellites and uh, you can uh, reach more easily all the orbital planes that you're trying. Uh, because one thing that is very important when you're launching a constellation is the, to have the most uh, homogeneous uh, constellation possible so that you you don't have holes. Uh, in your in your coverage, um, this comes obviously from a, a lot of a new uh, Leo constellation project. Um, the link budget between a, a satellite that's uh, at uh, thirty six thousand kilometer and one that's uh, only at six hundred uh, is very different. So this is, uh, as I said earlier, a way to reduce uh, by a lot uh, the power that's needed to to reach a satellite and to collect the data. Um, I'd say all of this, why it's happening now, because it's benefiting from a lot of uh, uh, progress in uh, electronic technologies. Um, SDR, as you mentioned earlier, Clemence, and, uh, and secondly, uh, all um, microcontroller and uh, computation power that has increased by a lot. Uh, it enables uh, really new devices and new protocols to be implemented on board satellites. So how does, uh, how does it all work? Um, the model is quite simple. You have a device on ground, uh, it generates uh, a modulation that's transmitted to its antenna, uh, reaches the satellite whenever it's uh, in view. Each satellite can have a smaller or large coverage uh, depending on its altitude and on the, the antenna um, that it's using. Uh, obviously, the, the smaller number of satellites, the larger you want the coverage. Um, then uh, the satellite has to uh, uh, receives the um, receive the message, they modulate them, puts them in uh, uh, payloads on its telemetry whenever it reaches a, a ground station. Um, you need a, a network of ground station on the Earth, otherwise uh, the satellite can have to wait a little until it downloads its data. Uh, everything goes down to a, a mission center, and then uh, uh, for kinase, then it's processed. Uh, we do uh, we do basic uh, data processing until uh, we deliver it to uh, to our customers. And uh, just one one side of a uh, commercial for kinase. Who are we? Uh, as I said, we're a satellite operator. Um, we're a spin-off of uh, CLS and uh, CNES, which is French uh, Space Agency. Um, we we were uh, created last year. Um, we raised 100 million uh, beginning of this year to launch uh, 25 satellites 
constellation. We're already operating uh, eight satellites uh, from previous uh, August generation. And uh, you can see on the, on the right uh, side of the screen, uh, the satellite itself, uh, it's a uh, 60U. You can see the, the antenna uh, at 400 megahertz and uh, an AIS uh, antenna, which is which, uh, six, uh, six antennas. Um, and uh, yeah, we're pretty proud of this guy. We will be launching in uh, 2023. Uh, Kinase, as I said, uh, created uh, 20, 2018. 45 employees uh, today, and numbers are still growing. We're operating eight satellites uh, to connect uh, 20,000 devices today. And um, yeah, basically that's it. Uh, our project, 25 satellites, why 25? Because we felt that was a, a good number to, to be able to provide the, uh, low latency enough and, uh, and good revisit time. Uh, we need, with that, 20 ground stations. Um, and we're building uh, all of this with uh, CNES, French Space Agency, Thalassania Space, and uh, Emeria. Uh, as I said, it's important to have a very homogeneous constellation. So we, we have uh, five planes of uh, Helios syn synchronous orbits. Um, we have a secondary payload for AIS, uh, AIS signal detection for uh, ships um, uh, tracking. Uh, we're using electro electric propulsion on board the satellite. This is very important to be able to maintain uh, the phasing of the different satellites. And this uh, enables us to reach uh, under, under 15 minutes uh, revisit time. So revisit time is the, the average time you have to wait between two satellite passes. Um, at uh, 600 kilometer, one satellite pass uh, for us uh, is between uh, uh, three to, to 10 minutes uh, average. And this was the, the space side, uh, the satellite side. We obviously need the devices on the ground. Uh, so we're also putting a lot of effort uh, to develop those components. Uh, we are we're building and um, uh, developing chipsets and modules. Chipsets is basically a very small uh, RF component that is generating uh, the modulation and uh, uh, acting as a receiver to demodulate the signals. So this, uh, this small chipset can, uh, um, after you put an antenna, receive uh, the signal coming from space, uh, coming, it's coming very low, and then it uh, can demodulate, find out the frequency, uh, compensate the Doppler for the, the satellite that is moving, uh, and then you can receive your data. Uh, we're building this, we're building a, the, a module which is a slightly more complicated component, integrating more intelligence and uh, already uh, uh, amplifying power uh, needed to reach space. And uh, we're supplying a lot of uh, development kits and interface boards uh, to go for various, um, uh, I'd say, um, environment, dev development environment compatible with uh, a terrestrial IoT today. Quick picture to illustrate what I was saying. You can see the, the chipset, seven millimeter by seven millimeter, and the, the module two by three uh, centimeter. Um, this is basically the, this component. Uh, the module is you need to uh, uh, put a, a battery on it and then and an antenna, and basically you can you can be received by the satellite. So pretty amazing what, what we can do now. Our applications. Um, we, as I said, uh, Argos uh, historically was uh, very focused on environmental businesses uh, for science and uh, fisheries uh, monitoring, um, animal tracking. Uh, today, we were expanding those activities and uh, going into uh, logistics, industrial IoT, or smarter agriculture. Um, we have a project on going for cattle tracking in for extensive farming, for example. Uh, with the application uh, where you can also, for example, I don't know, detect uh, the, the animal behavior and then uh, you can send alerts, whatever you you find out that the, the animal is acting weird. Uh, for logistic, where you can obviously think about container tracking, uh, but also uh, monitoring of uh, uh, conditions of transport, uh, monitoring temperature, pressure, uh, whatever you need to make sure your, your packages are, are, are delivered safely. Um, and uh, we also have application uh, combining a search and rescue uh, satellite system with uh, Argos uh, 
uh, tracking to provide uh, uh, devices for the, uh, the outdoors and for people who go on adventures and uh, uh, want to be uh, want to be tracked and we we ensure that they can be safe and uh, their family can follow them and they can uh, call for rescue whenever they need. Um, as part, so how do we how do we secure the communication? As you can imagine, there are uh, there are many links. Uh, it links uh, you know, can present different threats. Um, I won't be talking too much about the, the ground side uh, when whenever it has reached uh, the ground station and then communication to the mission center and then the user. Uh, it all goes through internet, so uh, um, it's mostly very standard, uh, secure protocol. Uh, there, we make sure that um, every component uh, of the chain, especially uh, all components that can uh, uh, talk directly to the gun station and then to the satellite, are very secured and uh, isolated from everything else. Uh, only a very few people are, are authorized uh, to to access it. So. Um, uh, all the links between uh, ground and space. Uh, as I said, we have a uh, AIS uh, receiver on board. Basically, here we only depend on a standard AIS uh, protocol that's defined. So we just uh, receive the, the, the data here. Um, we're using a proprietary uh, a protocol for uh, Kinase data collection services, uh, a blink and downlink. So we have a dedicated modulation and protocols for, for those two links. I'll be uh, coming back to this uh, in my next slide. Um, and for telecom and telemetry, uh, which are the, the most important links, then here we have uh, encrypted and authenticated communication. Um, each satellite is identified, one station is identified. Um, and uh, here we, we use uh, our own uh, proprietary uh, protocols uh, also. So what are the threats, uh, especially on the link between the device and the satellite? Uh, obviously, you can have a uh, interception. Uh, you can uh, have uh, someone trying to uh, uh, spoof a device, uh, pretending to be it, and then send uh, data to the satellite. Uh, you can have um, uh, very easy attacks. Uh, you record signal and then you replay it, and uh, and you can have uh, basically jammers uh, trying uh, uh, to um, provide in to make interference with your own uh, devices connected. Uh, so what can we do about uh, about all these? Um, there are various answers. Uh, I won't give all the details obviously today, but uh, I can uh, I can explain a, a little more. Um, data encryption is the base the basis very uh, because you can understand. Uh, we authenticate um, each uh, message that been sent on the network. So uh, each time we receive something, uh, there is a uh, a check that is made to verify that the message uh, is uh, complete and that it has been sent by the device whose ID we can see in the message. Um, so this this is a, a protection uh, against uh, spoofing mainly and um, uh, replay attacks. Um, we have uh, counters, message counters, and other other uh, items that prevent from replaying a, a, a message. Um, we have uh, obviously a, a closed protocol, which is proprietary. So, and if you listen to the signal, uh, the first thing is you need to understand wh wh what is where, uh, which bit is used for what. Um, it's um, you can you need to think about that the the IoT traffic is a very not so frequent. Um, device can send uh, one to twenty messages a day. Um, so at the end of the day, it's not so much traffic to run a, a reboot force attack in, in some cases. Um, and then finally, we also uh, have a device certification. So we know uh, all the kind of devices that are allowed to talk on our network. And this, is pro this provides an extra uh, security for us. And uh, last, um, last thing I wanted to, to focus on, uh, is also something we we can do to help uh, protect the integrity of uh, our system is that we do um, a Doppler uh, localization. So the physics is very simple um, because um, devices can send uh, 
um, multiple messages over the same satellite pass. Uh, the satellite receives it from a different position uh, and it has different speed regarding uh, the position of the beacon when um, when this happens. So uh, this enables uh, with very precise uh, frequency measurement uh, and very precise uh, frequency oscillator in the device itself. Uh, this uh, enables for quite quite precise uh, Doppler localization of the device itself down to uh, 150 meter, for example. Uh, in, in best cases. Um, so this makes it quite harder uh, for a device to, to spoof another one, especially if you have multiple um, multiple uh, satellite uh, visibility, because then uh, the, the messages are received by various devices and um, you can know where the device was uh, in the past. And if you see it coming from somewhere else, then it's, it's getting complicated. Um, we can uh, locate uh, jammers this way and um, even uh, even if uh, the device has a GNSS, the GNSS can be spoofed more easily um, and uh, the double localization is a, is a complementary um, check to validate that the, the GNSS position that's been received is, uh, is correct. So basically that was um, that was it for my presentation. I'll be happy to uh, uh, answer all, all your questions uh, uh, at the end. Handing it back to you, Clemence. Thank you so much for me. It was a very interesting and complete uh, presentation. I already received a lot of questions from uh, the audience. Um, so with all those um, increasing numbers of connected devices and new actors coming in the sector, um, there's uh, really a lot of um, cybersecurity concerns that uh, James Favre, our second guest speaker, will uh, present. Um, so James, I give you the floor right now. Great. Um, are you all able to see and hear me? Uh, we can hear you. We can yet see you. All right. Let me see if I've got the display up for screen sharing. Uh, any better now? Yes. Perfect. So yeah, um, I'm James Bavor. I'm a PhD student at Oxford University where I research satellite cybersecurity. And today I wanna to talk a little bit about how some of the changes in the way that we build and use satellites can impact the security of these systems, especially in light of the trends that are kind of bringing about IoT in space. Um, but before I wanna to get too into that, I wanna kind of start with a lesson I learned very early on in trying to research this area. So my rationale for picking satellite cybersecurity was very straightforward. I was like, space is really cool, so hacking is really cool, so hacking satellites is like the coolest thing to write a PhD thesis on. And I learned very quickly that it's actually quite hard to hack satellites today. And there are a lot of different reasons um, that act as barriers to someone who's interested in finding vulnerabilities in these systems. The first one is that you need deep pockets. Um, space equipment is really expensive historically. We're talking hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars to get equipment that is representative so that you can start researching vulnerabilities or finding exploits. Even once you get your hand on space equipment, there's a second issue here, which is that the space industry itself is fairly secretive um, for a lot of reasons. Sometimes this is a very conscious choice. A lot of government missions are classified. A lot of like rocketry components are arms controlled, for example. But it's also kind of an incidental and cultural effect. The aerospace industry is fairly insular. Um, it doesn't really intersect a lot with the cybersecurity world or the computer science world. Um, so it can be very hard as an outsider to kind of get started on applying general cybersecurity knowledge to the specific domain of space. And then finally, even after you get all of the money and you make the effort to understand a system, satellite systems are quite diverse. They're very different from each other. Historically, space missions are very bespoke kind of one-off operations, kind of me mega engineering projects. And so as an attacker, if you find a vulnerability in a satellite, you don't necessarily know that that's going to apply to other satellites or other space missions. So the payoff for a lot of effort can be very low. 
Now, what I want to do is kind of talk about how I grappled with these three barriers in the context of a specific case, and then use that to kind of broad, draw broader lessons about the industry and about how hacking satellites is starting to change. So what I looked at in my research pretty early on was uh, satellite internet communications, specifically VSAT services, very small aperture terminals, uh, like this one here, um, that you would put on a boat or an airplane in order to stay connected to the internet while you're in some remote locations. And I'm going to kind of walk through each of those barriers and how they apply to the VSAT case and then how we were able to kind of work our way around them as a model for attacking these systems. So the first barrier is that VSAT terminals like this can get quite expensive. When we're talking about the equipment that you would see on a cargo vessel or a cruise ship, we're talking tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars for these services. What we realized pretty early on though is that for a variety of kind of commercial and technical reasons, this equipment often operates in the same spectrum that you would expect to see television services. So for example, a lot of VSAT services operate in the KU band. And so our first intuition was to see how far kind of like standard home television equipment could get us in terms of being able to intercept and interpret these signals. Uh, we picked up a PCIe card like this. Um, they're widely available and fairly cheap uh, because people want to watch like satellite television on their computers. So it's not very hard to get access to this kind of equipment. And over the past five to 10 years, these cards have gotten pretty sophisticated in terms of their ability to keep up with complicated modulation schemes and to be able to do things like hunt for feeds on different satellites. You combine that with kind of a standard satellite dish and you're able to at least receive signals that are coming off of these satellite platforms that we know offer VSAT services. The next challenge is really a reverse engineering challenge. It's dealing with that kind of secretive and insular na uh, nature of the industry. There are no satellite internet providers that post on their website, this is the protocol we use, this is the frequency we use. Um, and so you have to kind of piece that all together. The first challenge was actually just finding the signals that were carrying internet traffic. And one of the big edges here is that there's a lot of software these days that's designed to help people scan the radio spectrum, whether that's for software defined radio applications or if it's specifically for hunting like satellite television channels. And you can kind of apply a broad scan of the KU band of the radio spectrum, start to pick out where interesting frequencies are going to be. If you combine this with some public like open source intelligence information like FCC license filings for providers, you can get a sense of what frequencies they're using to offer their internet services. And you can start looking at the actual signals that are coming off of those positions. Once you have this, the next challenge is to figure out which protocols are being used so that you can make meaning out of these radio signals. One of the nice things about internet services is that there are high incentives towards standardization, right? You want your airplane to be able to connect to satellite internet, whether you're over the Atlantic Ocean or the Pacific Ocean, and you maybe even want to be able to switch service providers. And so having standard protocols is very common in the VSAT world. Uh, we eventually determined that the basic protocol that was being used by these particular services was the DVBS or Digital Video Broadcasting for Satellite Standard. And then on top of that was a standard called Generic Stream Encapsulation or GSE. Both of these are open standards. Uh, that means that they're publicly described in online documents. So as attackers, all we had to do was kind of read through these documents and write a tool that interprets these standards. And then in theory, we could understand what was happening in these signals. Unfortunately, that's where we ran into the third challenge, which is that there was actually quite a lot of errors with our initial approach. We found that there were a lot of differences in the way that these signals were uh, operating from provider to provider or from satellite to satellite. Sometimes this was because our equipment was quite cheap and we just didn't have high enough quality equipment to keep up with some of the more complicated network modulation schemes and kind of more complicated signals. Sometimes it was also due to proprietary modifications to the protocol standard, things like header extensions or kind of modified versions of GSE. And so we took a step back and we said, you know, we aren't trying to design a satellite modem. We don't have to get this perfect. How close can we get that would be good enough for an attacker to find something interesting? And we built a tool that we called GSE Extract, and it essentially cheats at the signal processing problems. It, focuses on the absolute easiest packets to find, the stuff that's at the start of a payload, the stuff that clearly has an IP header, and just kind of brute forces at scale. Computers can keep up with these schemes. The networks don't have high enough bandwidth that it's really a struggle to do a lot of guess and checking. And what we got was good enough for an attacker. This image on the right is a great example. 
Uh, we intercepted this from an email that an engineer aboard a maritime vessel sent about a maintenance issue. And you can kind of see the results of using this approach. We were able to get a good chunk of this image before we started losing packets and having kind of signal processing errors. And then we couldn't decompress the rest of the JPEG file. But if there was something interesting in that top chunk, that might be enough to kind of get a hacker started. And in practice, we found that it often was enough. So for example, um, we identified that when cargo vessels and other ships would pull into ports, they would often have to transmit visa and immigration information to various authorities in the different jurisdictions. And these would be sent sometimes via insecure protocols like web servers. Uh, this is a capture that we got from an Indian cargo vessel that had basically a list of all of the crew members, their passports, and their date of birth. Um, on board and it was being broadcast in clear text across the footprint of a geostationary satellite. So we're talking tens of millions of square kilometers. Another great example um, that I thought was pretty interesting was that we saw a lot of personal communications, people who were using insecure email protocols, for example, over a satellite link. Uh, this is a particularly fun example. It's an email that we intercepted um, from the captain of a Greek billionaire's mega yacht. He had forgotten his Microsoft account password login. Um, and so the email with that password reset link came over clear text. It's pretty intuitive to see how this could be used to either uh, target a high net worth individual in a sophisticated phishing operation or engage in kind of a more scalable account hijacking style attack. We also saw operational data that affected kind of the actual working of cargo and other vessels at sea. Um, a great example of this is that a lot of maritime companies will transmit navigational charts via FTP file shares. So there'll be a server running on a ship um, with a folder on the FTP file share where you'll copy over kind of the latest nautical charts. And um, the passwords for these were being sent in clear text over the satellite link and were pretty easily intercepted. And depending on the specific implementation of their navigational terminals, it could be pretty straightforward for an attacker to say, modify a nautical chart and upload a malicious one that's missing a sandbar or something. And that could have pretty catastrophic environmental consequences or operational consequences. We also saw some traffic from airplanes, uh, which was interesting. Um, a good example of this and kind of the IoT environment is the emergence of these things called femtocells, which are essentially miniature cell towers um, that they put on airplanes that you can do things like send text messages or receive calls just as if you were on the ground from your phone. And so if you forget to put your phone in airplane mode or if you're consciously using one of these towers, um, it turns out that the traffic on the other side is being broadcast across these satellite feeds. And so we're able to do things like read SMS text messages that were destined to individuals aboard various flights. And that can reveal all kinds of sensitive information. A great example is this image here, which includes a uh, negative coronavirus test result that an individual received during his transatlantic flight. And I think it's a really good example of how this kind of deeply sensitive information can get broadcast in these networks because these networks were designed kind of with an assumption that nobody would be able to listen to them or interested in listening to them because the barriers to entry were so high. But now that those barriers are changing, it kind of needs to recalculate what the security framework looks like. And I could talk kind of about the VSAT vulnerabilities all day, but what I wanna talk about instead is kind of broader trends, how we see the similar pattern of these assumptions that space is expensive, space is hard to understand, satellites are also unique that nobody can hack them, um, can kind of start to change in other aspects of how we build satellites. So let's start with the first assumption, which is that space technology is just too expensive to get at for hackers, too hard to understand in a way. Uh, this image here is a screenshot from a website in Durosat where you can basically purchase um, manufactured cube satellites uh, for about 25,000 euros on the cheaper side of things, which is unfathomably inexpensive compared to what it would have cost for space hardware a decade ago. And we kind of see this trend in general in the way that satellite missions are starting to be conceived. We see a lot of commercial off-the-shelf components, whether it's a fully assembled satellite or little bits of a satellite. So as an attacker, instead of having to work for an aerospace company or get access to an entire functioning satellite, you might be able to buy just a specific camera or GPS or flight control module and start looking for vulnerabilities in that specific commercial module. Additionally, we see the emergence of software-defined radios. Uh, there's been a little talk about this already, but one of the interesting things from an attacker's perspective is that a lot of the frequencies that are allocated for space communications traditionally have not been easy to purchase consumer hardware that's designed to interact with them. So for example, a lot of satellite telemetry is in the S-band and a lot of S-band like communications equipment can get quite expensive. Uh, but with a software-defined radio and either a custom antenna or a wideband antenna, 
you may be able to actually receive and play with these networks in a way that would have been incredibly difficult not too long ago. Another trend that we're seeing that makes it easier for an attacker to kind of engage in operations against satellites is the emergence of these ground station as a service offerings, whether that's a community project like Satnogs or a commercial product like Amazon Web Services Ground Station, where instead of having to build a ground station yourself, you can use someone else's ground station and maybe pay for it. For an attacker who wants to upload a malicious payload or send a malicious command to a satellite, being able to rent access to a ground station on a per minute basis is dramatically more attractive than having to spend the millions of dollars involved in building a sophisticated satellite teleport. And so we can kind of see how these individual trends are making it so that attackers can kind of afford to engage in attacks against satellites, but they still need to understand the satellites. And so there's a question here as to whether or not space technology will remain kind of secretive and insular. This screenshot here is code from Cubos, which is an open source operating system for cube satellites um, that is based off of Linux. And it speaks towards a general trend towards the use of open source space technology. Another good example is NASA's core flight system. Both of these operating systems have some flight heritage and they are open source. They kind of do the basic things a satellite needs to do so that when you're running a satellite mission, you can focus on the application specific components, the most interesting bits for your project. And as an attacker, this means that you have access to a lot of very deep information about how real satellites work and can potentially target vulnerabilities against that specific code that's running on a satellite. Another good example of this is the emergence of open communication standards. I talked in the VSAT case about how open standards related to, for example, the transmitting of IP packets allowed us to design our tool around kind of the theory of interpreting these protocols. Now, I'm not saying that open standards are a bad thing. I think they're uh, almost always a good thing to have uh, if they consciously include security. Uh, CCSDS here is an intergovernmental organization that essentially tries to design a bunch of different protocol standards for satellites. And they have some really nifty standards for doing telemetry communications and some really nifty standards for doing telemetry communications securely. And if you only choose one of those feature sets and it's not the security one, you may end up in a situation where you've made it easier for an attacker to understand how you're communicating and haven't appropriately compensated uh, with security protections that are like consciously there to get in the attacker's way. Another good example of this that kind of takes a different angle on this problem is the emergence of commercial space entities at a scale we haven't seen before. Uh, SpaceX is the obvious big name for commercial space, but just in general, uh, commercial entities tend to have a different relationship with secrecy than kind of your more traditional government projects. And this is especially true for kind of the scrappier tech companies that we're seeing get involved in space these days. Uh, you'll get information in like press releases uh, describing specific hardware choices or specific partnerships that might be involved in a platform that reveals some information to an attacker. We also see regulatory differences here. Commercial entities often have to register the frequencies they're transmitting on in a very precise way through like FCC filings. So for example, it's public knowledge, the specific radio frequencies and the specific antennas that SpaceX has on their Falcon 9 rocket because all of that's in FCC filings. And that degree of information would be much harder to get about government space missions. So the last question is whether or not space technology will stay diverse. Maybe we can find a vulnerability, but how do we know that we can apply it at scale? This image here is a graphic from Lockheed Martin Marketing Materials that describes a product they call SmartSat, which is uh, basically a software-defined satellite in their language. And the idea is that they've built out all of the parts of a satellite that everyone would use for a satellite mission. And then you just add the bits that you need for your specific application, whether that's a camera or a sensor or a communications antenna. And this general idea of having kind of centralized, consistent baseline platforms is decreasing the diversity of implementation in space and making space cheaper. Uh, we also see that in those open source operating systems I've seen or even closed source operating systems where you can kind of focus on your applications and an attacker who finds a vulnerability in one of these flight control systems might be able to impact a lot of different satellites with that same vulnerability. That combined with the general purpose uh, satellite bus hardware can potentially lead to attacks that uh, impact satellites of different sizes or different purposes across the industry, as opposed to just belonging to a single company or a single type of mission. However, it's also important to recognize that even just impacting a single company or a specific type of mission looks very different when we're talking about these mega constellations. SpaceX is launching about 60 satellites of Fortnite for their Starlink operation. And the reason they can do this is because all of these satellites are functionally identical. 
And so if you find a vulnerability in one Starlink platform, there's a very good chance that as an attacker, you can apply that to many. And this kind of scale of space missions really increases the advantage an attacker has when they're able to find an exploit. So to kind of sum things up into a central lesson for people who are interested in building secure space missions, I think that uh, the industry needs to remember that they can't hide forever from attackers. And the space industry has done a really good job, perhaps a better job than any sector I can think of, of hiding from cyber attacks. There are a lot of structural factors about the way space missions work and the way satellites are built and designed and the business functions of this industry that have acted as barriers to entry for attackers and people who want to harm these systems. However, going forward, we're seeing changes in the technology that's used to make satellites that has incidental effects on these structural factors that are a little bit chaotic and a little bit hard to pick out. It's hard to know that a software defined radio that some hobbyist on the ground is using could impact the security of your satellite's telemetry protocols. And so as these threat models shift that we need to be a little careful that these small tech changes are taken into account. Um, I'm not saying we should not embrace the kind of new space mentality of having cheaper satellites that are easier to build and more open. I think those are all great things and will really improve the way that space can make our lives better. But as we dive into this next generation of space, I think it's important to make security a conscious choice. Um, in the world of aerospace engineering, it's, it's very tempting to think of risks as a probabilistic Thing. There's, you know, some percent chance that a piece of orbital debris will strike your satellite. You can diminish that risk uh, by taking various precautions such that the percent chance is low. And it's very hard to have that same kind of probabilistic risk modeling when we're talking about an intelligent adversary who can change their strategy or take advantage of new shifts in technology or markets to attack in a different way. And so while there's a temptation often to try to model cyber risk in the same way that we model safety, um, I think that as a general rule of thumb, you should be very suspicious whenever the temptation is there to try to accept a cyber risk or to reduce a cyber risk to an acceptable level. To some degree, this is inevitable, but I think to the extent that it can be avoided when you're designing a space mission or kind of planning what you think a likely attack vector is, you should prioritize uh, security, even if a kind of safety mindset wouldn't say so. Thank you so much for listening to the presentation. I'm happy to answer questions now or over email. And if you're curious specifically about the VSAT research study, there's a lot more information online about it. Thanks. Thank you so much, James. That's uh, very interesting. Um discoveries that you made and it, this is honestly fascinating and uh, i see a lot of people in the audience that are also uh fascinated by by what you you discovered and and your your research um so maybe i will first ask um uh take a, a question from the audience and um it's about ensuring satellites against cyber attacks and um, so maybe James um, and also Remy, you can uh, give your opinion. Is it um, uh, relevant to ensure satellites against cyber attack? Is it too expensive? And what will be the, the pros and cons of, of ensuring satellites against cyber attacks? Thank you. Well, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I'm not an expert on insurance and especially not insurance for satellite missions. I think that one of the appeals of trying to ensure a satellite mission against cyber attacks is that you potentially hand over that very tricky risk calculus of trying to decide what the actual likelihood of a threat is to someone who has more expertise in determining that. And so, especially if you're not super confident in your own threat modeling, cyber insurance can kind of help you decide what degree of risk is acceptable and kind of plan your mission around that, which I think is really appealing. Um, but also you're correct that it can be quite expensive and it's possible that insurance companies are passing off the like inherent unknowability of cyber risk onto you in forms of the premiums and the cost of that policy. So I think it's a, it's a pretty difficult business decision right now. I, I agree with, I agree totally. Uh, and I'll, I'll add one more difficulty is how do you evaluate the consequence of the prejudice? I mean, if, if the satellite gets hacked, uh, what what is hacked exactly? Can you just get data? Can you control the satellite? Can you upload something on the satellite? These these are very different uh, 
uh, ways of attacking the satellite and can have very, very different consequences. I mean, if you get access to uh, the, the electronic propulsion uh, of the satellite, then, then what can you do with it? So it, I think it's very difficult to find a business model for an insuring uh, service uh, in that regard. Thank you. So yes, um, assessing the damage is indeed required to ensure the, the, the satellite itself. Um, so there's another question from Dan Diana Chiquez Garcia about um, your Kines uh, constellation. And she was wondering if the security requirements uh, that you're applying uh, are requirements that you decided um, as a company or are they required by the state, so France or the EU maybe? Um, and what kind of uh, decisions are internal and maybe what kind of decisions uh, are required by the state? Um, I'm, I'm familiar with the the, uh, uh, the law on uh, space operation in France. I know it's one of the laws that has been is most the most advanced in uh, uh, the way it controls uh, the satellites and the way they are launched and the way they operated. I don't know if they go that far as to analyze very precisely the protocols and the security protocols that are, are in place. What I can say is. Um, our our protocols and our security measures they're, they're based on uh, uh, previous knowledge uh, from uh, uh, the CNES and the French Space Agency and all previous missions. Um, that's why also we, we we're working with uh, uh, big players like Thales Alenia Space, who have a, a long uh, history of uh, uh, bigger satellite and very secured infrastructure. Um, so we basically. Um, benefiting from all their experience in, in that regard uh, for, for our protocols. Thank you. Do you have um, any opinion, James, maybe on, on regulations that um, states can uh, require from satellite companies? Yeah, I don't know a ton about the specifics of space regulations, but I do know from my experience with disclosing specifically those vulnerabilities to like satellite internet service providers that there was quite a degree of uh, ambiguity, at least perceived by them, in terms of who had responsibility for encrypting communications and ensuring they were secure. So we would disclose to a satellite operator and they would say, oh, we went, we rent that transponder. So it's the person who's using its responsibility to ensure it's encrypted. We would talk to the internet service provider and they would say, oh, it's the customer's job to ensure that they're encrypting their traffic. It's sensitive. We just provide internet services. And so I think that regulatory clarity could go a long way in terms of being sure that the person who is taking control of that risk knows that they're taking control of that risk. Because kind of each person in the line assumed that someone else was going to deal with the cybersecurity prospects for them. Thank you. So I have another question from the audience uh, who is wondering um, whether the oil orbit constellation will be better for cybersecurity because maybe uh, applying encryption is uh, less convenient than in geo orbit. So will this have an effect or is encryption still applicable in geo orbit, but it's just maybe not um, good financially if you're a company. So what is the maybe differences um, in orbit for uh, applying encryption? Um, James, yeah, you take this one. Sure, I'll give it a go. <laughs> I think that, um, yeah, the uh, perspective there, that's a really good point. It is much, much easier to encrypt internet traffic from low Earth orbit because latency is lower. Um, there are all kinds of specific properties of the TCP protocol that's often used for internet websites that makes it really sensitive to high latency systems. And so when we're beaming something all the way up to geo and back, that latency problem means that if you use uh, a VPN to encrypt your traffic, your internet service provider can't optimize that traffic as well as they could if it was unencrypted. Uh, whereas in low Earth orbit, you still have a uh, latency that's not as good as on the ground. Um, but the effect is much lower. So you can use a tool like a VPN without seeing your connection slow in quite the same way. 
Um, so I think that it's definitely, it's possible to encrypt traffic to geo if you design your systems right, but it's easier to adopt existing encryption in low earth orbit because it's just very similar to what you would expect from a terrestrial network. Remy? No, I don't have much more to add. Um, uh, everything you mentioned, James, says, uh, was nice. And it's related to um, broadband and internet. So in space IoT, um, then here that the real time uh, is a different matter. So uh, whether you take one more second to reach the satellite or to decode everything, uh, it's n not necessarily a matter. So in this case, there wouldn't be necessarily a difference between geo and Leo orbit. So then I'm going to take one um, last question from the audience. Um, so someone is wondering uh, if applying cyber situational awareness uh, to satellites is uh, a good idea to prevent from cyber attacks and is it significantly uh, more expensive for companies to do that or is it still worth it? I don't know. Um, yeah, I'm not you... sure. Yeah, I'm not sure I'm the right person at Kinase to answer. But uh, so you mentioned what cyber uh, situation with us? Trying to see what's going on in all your network and see where the data goes and if there's something that goes out or something that connects um, that is not authorized, which is in a way what you explained. Uh, but I wonder if like the risk cost associated with that um, is really hard for a company really or or not so uh, i'll try to answer um so i think as long as you you're monitoring the, everything that happens on the ground uh, between your ground station your control center your mission center all the blocks that are connected to the internet then you can you can go very far in the monitoring of the traffic and and trying to uh, identify threats so an anomaly in the traffic you're seeing um, but once you're dealing with the satellite itself uh, then if you want to be able to monitor everything and detect um, malfunction uh, you might need to add another layer of, of uh, uh, monitoring that uh, on top of what you're already doing and then this will affect your traffic your data that you have to go to bring up and down. Um, so this would probably be more complicated. Um, but I think also today uh, on the satellite, there are a lot of uh, parameters that are monitored and the, all the housekeeping of the of the satellite is still used a lot uh, to monitor the satellite itself, all the events that can happen. Um, so I, I, I would expect an anomaly to be quickly detected uh, on a satellite because of all this habit of monitoring everything that happens on the satellite already. Yeah, I think all of that is, are good points. Um, I do think that um, monitoring, like in general, being aware of what's happening on your networks is an important component of keeping the system secure. I think that satellites are really tricky here because um, they're essentially compute like a, a satellite is not very different from a computer that you like leave on a street corner, other than the fact that it's a little bit harder to physically reach. Um, it's, you know, over a bunch of different countries and in a bunch of different areas where people can send signals to it. Um, and so monitoring on a satellite is a very, very tall order, especially because um, an attacker who successfully compromises it could also potentially compromise the monitoring application itself and so being able to understand how you can trust your telemetry data and your housekeeping data um, and ensure that it's authentic is good and then i i do agree with the, the point that the telemetry data that we already use is a good starting point for kind of thinking about how we design this onboard monitoring because it is a very different problem in space than it is in orbit but it's a problem that we've already dealt with in kind of a mechanical sense and i think converting that to a cybersecurity. Uh, tool as well is, is a great intuition and a good first step, although I think it's a pretty hard problem to actually implement. 
Uh, there's uh, one last question from the audience about um, the accountability in uh, IoT systems and in uh, space operations. So um, I assume that's in terms of responsibility in case of a cyber attack. So I don't know uh, who would like to take this question. I mean, I think in case of a cyber attack, the it won't be very different than in case of you and if you're a telecommunication operator on ground then you're obviously still responsible for uh, stuff that happens on your on your equipment uh, but then you you have um, you can you can see two two points where the regulation can can play a role uh, there's obviously the frequency uh, that you use and and this is regulated so anyone that's trying to use this spectrum or whatever you do with this spectrum is uh, kind of uh, regulated, monitored by your uh, national frequency agency. Uh, so there's a regulation point where you, you're still accountable for what you do with this uh, asset that is uh, the frequency. And it, it doesn't really belong to anyone. It belongs to everyone. So you need to be accountable for that. And then the second item is uh, um, some countries are starting to uh, put uh, harder laws on, on space operations. And this is... a uh, a good frame for what you can or cannot do with a satellite. Uh, so here you also have a, a, a lever to, to maybe put more um, constraints and, and rules on uh, uh, what you're supposed to do with your satellite. Um, and, and, and in this case, you're accountable for what happens with your satellite. So uh, you, you have a commitment to a DRB in case something goes wrong or whatever. That there are different uh, rules that apply. So uh, you can imagine maybe that this uh, this uh, law in the future uh, can be can be more strict on the the cybersecurity uh, um, threats management. Yeah. Yeah, I don't have much to add to that. I think that accountability um, from a cybersecurity perspective, a lot of it is about kind of consciously deciding um, who's in charge of different threats and who's in charge of controlling different risks when you deal with shared systems like an IoT network or a satellite platform, especially if there are multiple payloads on it. And so I think that in terms of regulations and stuff that deal with accountability, a lot of just assigning responsibility for certain components of the system uh, could be clarified in, in regulatory environments. Thank you. So uh, we're already over time. So um, we're gonna finish this webinar right now. I thank you all for joining. Thank you, Arimi. Thank you, James, for being great speakers. Your presentation were really interesting and complete. Um, there's a lot of really complicated challenges at the crossroad of the IoT and uh, the space sector. Um, and I'm sure there will be even more with the emergence of 5G, so um, that will be space-based in a part. So um, that will be maybe the topic of a next webinar. Uh, the um, recording of this webinar will be uploaded on YouTube uh, in the coming weeks or months, so you will be able to catch up. I encourage all, you all to check the research papers that James wrote and uh, to check that what Kineas is doing. Um, thank you all. I wish you uh, well. Uh, goodbye. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Thank you.